Hi everyone, this is Ezekiel O'Callaghan with Raptor Chatter, here to talk about what happened for March in paleontology. And so without any further ado, let's get started. First, we're going to look at a brand new abelosaur that was described, named Eucalcan aleocranius, meaning the one who brings fear. Many of these different features, though, may be attributable to just the ontogeny of abelosaurs, though, meaning essentially the changes in the animal as it grows. And in fact, from the same formation, there's already another abelosaur known, which is larger, via venator. This is actually really interesting, because the researchers find this young specimen of Yulkacan to actually be very closely related to via venator, and so it may actually be completely synonymous. However, there's not a lot of research on the growth of the abelosaurs, and so there needs to be more done with this. The only closely related thing that we have that has had study done on their growth series is Majungasaurus, which is a distantly related Abelosaur. However, it does show some of the same processes that we do see in this young version of what is potentially via venator in Yulkacan. One example of this is a T-shaped black mulvome, which young Majungasaurus have, but the adults do not. And this is something that we actually see in via venator and Yulkacan, where Yulkacan has this and was a young animal, and Via Venator doesn't. So if this same kind of process occurred in both Majungasaurus and Via Venator, it would help to suggest that Yulkacan is just a junior synonym, or a young version of Via Venator. But again, more needs to be done on this. There was also a paper on another abelosaur, and that's Xenotarsosaurus. Xenotarsosaurus is generally fairly impartial. However, this study does help to confirm that it is indeed an abelosaur, and probably a pretty early diverging one at that. One concern with this paper, though, is that they haven't used some of the most recently found taxon, such as both Yulkacan and the earlier mentioned this year, Spectrovenator. But that's because these finds happening with the Bielosaurs are coming out very, very quickly. So it's nothing against the authors, just that the science is happening faster than some researchers have access to the materials. So hopefully with all of this being found, there will be new material found for Bielosaurs so we can better understand what exactly they were doing and how they became so dominant in the later stages of the Cretaceous, especially in South America. Changing gears, we're going to actually look at a paleo-environmental study, and specifically about the G-hole biota which is one of the most famous Lagerstattens coming from China, where many feathered dinosaurs are found, including things like Cetacosaurus and also Microraptor. What this paper found is that there wasn't a lot of activity in the lakes at the time, likely due to a relatively cool environment and a lot of volcanic activity that was happening. However, eventually the environment did locally warm, and some of the volcanic activity ceased. This means those volcanoes would have stopped spewing as much toxic gases into the water, but the minerals that were already deposited by those ash falls would be in the water. And this created a lot of space for different types of algae and other microbes to start developing in that water, and that would have formed the basis for a very broad and diverse ecosystem, which we do see in the upper stages of the G-hole biota. So while generally we do think of mainly the dinosaurs that are found in this kind of biota, it is important to remember that there's a lot of other creatures and organisms that lived in the environment that we don't think of as much, and there were a lot of factors at play into what exactly made this biota what it was. Another famous Lagerstatten is the Crato Formation in Brazil, from which many famous fossils have been found, such as Ubi Rajara, which was actually smuggled out of the country and should be returned to it. However, this study also looked at the environment rather than fossils directly from it, although it did use fossils to understand the environment, and that's because it looked at mass die-offs of mayflies and some fish. In general, mayflies and fish breed in large numbers, and so when you have a mass die-off like that, it suggests some kind of stressor on the environment. What these researchers were able to suggest is that there was actually a lot of evaporation happening in the lake, at least at certain times of the year and varying from year to year. This means that these mass die-offs were likely associated with major evaporative events, and this helps to indicate that this is a system that was very much dynamic and went through a lot of changes, and also potentially helps us understand why some of the preservation within this formation is so good as this evaporation would raise salinity levels and make it less likely for microbes to fully decompose something, meaning it could be preserved so well in the rock. And then there was a new kind of shark also found from a Lagerstatten, this one in Mexico, which this particular Lagerstatten hasn't been particularly well defined, but the shark from it is very interesting because it's a laminiform shark, meaning it's closely related to things like the whale shark, but also great whites. However, it didn't look anything like either of those groups, Instead, it looked much more like a manta ray, with large wings helping it to swim through the water. Now, the manta rays properly didn't really diversify in great numbers until after the KPG extinction, and there are certain forms that do suggest that it is very much closely related to the laminiforms. 
named Aquila lamina millarse. It helps to show that there's a broad diversity of lamniform sharks before the KPG extinction, as this formation is actually in the Cretaceous. There's also been some question about the legality of how this fossil was dug up. However, a lot of that is still unresolved, and seemingly it is prepared for a museum that will go on display in the future. So hopefully it is in proper hands for future research, because it is a very interesting fossil and it should see more research. As for another more famous lamniform shark that's had a lot of debate surrounding it, we can look at Otodus megalodon, megalodon the shark, as opposed to megalodon the clam or bivalve, which you can check out my video on up here that I did for April Fools. One of the biggest debates surrounding Otodus megalodon has been how large it actually was. Most of the studies involving this have essentially just measured the tooth and put that on a linear graph to try and establish how big the animal was, and this has given a lot of variation from animals that are about 11 meters or a bit under 40 feet to 41 meters or 135 feet. So with that variation, there's not really a lot of help that we can try and narrow it down. Although most of these studies do lead it to be within 40 to 60 feet. A new study looked at a different method to try and estimate the size of Otodus megalodon. And that was instead of using the length of the teeth, using the width and essentially summing up the width of all of the teeth in a jaw and then from that extrapolating how large the animal was. And this was done with a number of different lamniform sharks, including the great white. The researchers then took the single largest known tooth of Otodus megalodon and estimated what the rest of the teeth in that jawline would have been sized as and estimated from there how large the shark actually would have been and came to a size of about 20 meters or about 66 feet. So slightly over most estimates. However, it is important to note that there is some variation in this and there is some potential bias in some of their numbers, which they do account for, seeing that there's a margin of error of about 3.5 meters on either end. This means that this does fall very close already to most estimates and potentially within that estimate. So this does seem like potentially a very good method of trying to estimate the size of some of these very, very large prehistoric sharks. Looking now at an animal on land that would have lived at the same time as Otodus megalodon, we have a kangaroo, which, you know, kangaroos are famous for hopping, but some of them actually climb trees, like the tree kangaroos, they're literally called that. These live in parts of northern Australia, New Guinea, and Indonesia. And there was actually another group of them that seemingly was trying to evolve similar adaptations to begin tree climbing, although this new species is actually only semi-arboreal. Named Congruous kitcheneri, this new tree kangaroo was actually a lot larger than the modern ones, so think of the modern ones, but chonkier. It also showed different adaptations where it couldn't necessarily climb trees as well, although it still would have in order to get to the leaves and feed on those. In fact, there's other adaptations that help to show how different it was from modern tree kangaroos, such as having a longer neck, which helps to imply that it definitely wasn't hopping around the branches nearly as much as modern tree kangaroos do, instead just reaching around the trees more like some primates do, although using a head instead of long arms. So it may have actually been filling a very similar niche to many primates today, although it is now extinct, so we'll never know exactly for sure. As for other animals that have a variety of forms that aren't often thought of that we do find in the fossil record, we have crocodilians. The 23-ish, depending on how it all turns out, species of crocodilians that we have today are all generally very water-loving and hunt as ambush predators. However, the fossil record shows that they were wildly, wildly diverse. In fact, there were some that became completely herbivorous, and some that were completely adapted to land or even completely adapted to living in the oceans. So there's a wide variety of different crocodilians that did exist. By studying these different radiations and how quickly the crocodilians were able to fill different niches within those radiations, researchers have been able to better understand some basic evolutionary dynamics, at least within the crocodilians. The paper suggests that first there needs to be ecological opportunity for an animal to fill. So it can't necessarily just fill in an entirely new niche if the space for that niche doesn't exist. However, once in that niche, it does show that diversification can happen very quickly within that niche, with multiple species branching off and filling the niche slightly differently. Additionally, the paper suggests that there are certain factors, such as the initial physiology of the animal and climatic factors, that don't really affect their ability to fill those niches. And so this is hopefully a pattern that we can start searching for in other animals, where essentially, once they diversify, they're able to fill in these different niches without much climatic pressure affecting how they are actually able to fill it. Now that we're back into archosaurs, we can actually look at other dinosaurs, such as the alvarosaurs, which were very strange, had essentially one finger on each of their hands, and no one exactly knows what they were doing with that. However, it has been suggested that they may have been eating termites and ants. 
This new study looked at the tails of alvarosaurs and was able to help suggest that potentially their tails may hold the key to what exactly they were doing. And that's because they had relatively long tails, something that we see in some animals which still eat ants and termites today. And that's because animals like pangolins and anteaters still need to travel long distances to get from food source to food source. Additionally, it does help to balance the animal while it's digging into these kind of termite mounds and anthills. So there is some potential evolutionary advantage to having a long tail, especially if you are eating ants so much. And it does help to suggest that we may finally have a better idea of what the alvarosaurs were actually doing, or at least the later ones, because many of the early ones don't quite have this same adaptation on the tail. And now within the birds, we actually have Vegavis, which I actually did a whole video on because the patrons voted on it for a what the hell is this video, literally two days before this paper came out. So I was able to include this paper in that video, so you can check that out for more information. But to summarize, it was good at swimming. But what exactly was it? Click the video to find out more details. Still within the dinosaurs, we have the bird-like trudontids, which had a new species described, this time coming from Europe, making it the first known European trudontid, named Tamaro inspiratus. Studies on the bone have helped to show that it was actually a subadult animal, and it was growing very, very quickly. This is similar to some other very early trudontids, such as Maylong. It actually fell and slayed a slightly different group of trudontids, though, than Maylong does, and that's the Jingfeng opterids, with animals like the Chinese Jingfeng opteryx and the Mongolian Philovenator. The very partial fossil of Tamaro helps to suggest that it was actually the largest of these Jingfeng opterids but it also helps us suggest that the Trudontids were able to migrate into Europe, which during this part of the Cretaceous was mostly a large set of islands, making an archipelago where Europe now is. This helps us suggest that there was at least some migration mechanics within the Trudontids to help them essentially island hop from place to place, although that needs to be studied in better detail. Some Chinese Trudontids, though, coming from the Jihol biota, which I mentioned earlier, also have preserved melanosomes, which essentially helps us understand what color they would have been. There was a paper that helped to study and establish if there is a bias in how some of these melanosomes might be preserved. There's basically a lot of chemistry that's involved in this, and it's a relatively short paper, but with that chemistry, I'm not necessarily confident in explaining exactly what's happening. However, I can tell you that essentially a lot of the metals that are found in the melanosomes can be stripped away from the melanosomes, and this can help change our perspectives of what they might be like. However, understanding why exactly these changes are occurring may be able to help us understand better what the color of these animals actually was. And so to totally change gears again, we're going to go way back in time, all the way to 900 million years ago, when some of the first algae fossils are found. Algaes, by molecular studies, have been shown to probably have evolved in fresh water and then moved to the ocean secondarily. But all molecular studies should be backed by the fossil record, and this study helps to do that. These fossils of marine algae actually show up 900 million years ago though, which is a full two to 300 million years before Snowball Earth, which would have added a lot of environmental pressures onto the organisms. Now, after Snowball Earth, there are some biomarkers in environments that does help to show that these marine algae actually became widespread. However, the fact that they evolved before Snowball Earth and didn't immediately spread does raise some questions about why this may have been, although that will need more study. Other studies using genetic data have also suggested some strange things about how animals may have actually evolved, with the comb jellies being sister taxa to all other animals, being the first divergence. It was always thought that sponges were actually in this place because morphologically, sponges are a lot simpler than other animals. And this new study looked at the molecular data in even greater detail and does reassess that actually sponges probably are the sister taxa. This just helps to go to show how very thorough studies need to be done using more and more data, and anything can be valid for critique. And so this is just another part of the scientific method that can hopefully help us understand how animals as a whole may have evolved. As for the origin of vertebrates, a lot of our understanding was thought to have come from essentially the larva of lampreys. And that's because the larval lampreys are essentially very small, very basic filter feeders. And it was thought this is what many of the first vertebrates were. However, a new study entirely throws that out of the water because it shows a very larval lamprey that still has the tooth suckers of the adults. This suggests that instead of having all lamprey larvae from the first one onward being filter feeders, the newest ones that we see today actually secondarily evolved filter feeding, and that these larvae then aren't exactly the best analogs for the very first vertebrates, because the larvae of the first lampreys already had these toothy mouths. 
This essentially just throws what we thought we knew about vertebrate evolution a little bit up in the air. So hopefully there will be more studies on both this fossil and other fossils of lampreys and very early diverging vertebrates, so we can get a better idea of how exactly they did diverge. There was also a paper on the potential origins of cephalopods, which are some of the most ubiquitous fossils in the fossil record, with all of the ammonites being examples of cephalopods, and also belemnites and a few others. Genetic studies suggest that the cephalopods should have developed by at least the early Cambrian, although fossils of them don't actually show up until the early Ordovician, so there's a large gap between where molecular data says they should have showed up and where the fossil record says they showed up. However, a new paper helps to lessen this gap by about 30 million years, moving the first potential fossils of the cephalopods from 490 million years ago to 522 million years ago. This is a relatively large gap and does help to suggest that they did evolve that early, although they just weren't quite as widespread until after the Cambrian. Also in invertebrates, we have the chelicerates, which include everything from the extinct Eurypterids to horseshoe crabs and the arachnids. However, this paper specifically looked at horseshoe crabs, and some of their origins, at least in certain groups. Horseshoe crabs have often been described as living fossils, unchanged for millions of years, but that's not exactly the case, as two different taxa show. The first shows a number of different spines that we don't see on modern horseshoe crabs, as well as a slightly different body form. The other, prolimulus woodward eye, helps to show that they actually didn't all have these spines, with some of them being very, very rounded, and also potentially living in more freshwater environments. So while horseshoe crabs may seem like they are very much all the same, there's some evidence they actually diversified quite well, and they also were occupying many different environments that they don't necessarily occupy today. Another study on chelicerates helps to suggest that the horseshoe crabs may not have even started in the water, instead starting on land with the arachnids and other chelicerates that we now find on land, like ticks and mites. This study used both genetic data and morphological data based on fossils to find that the eurypterids are probably slightly outside of the group that contains both arachnids and the horseshoe crabs, with horseshoe crabs being sister taxa to the arachnids. Now, this is different than a lot of other studies have suggest, as they essentially inverse the placement of the arachnids and the eurypterids. However, more important than this is, based on some of the genes in horseshoe crabs, the authors are able to suggest that, potentially, the ancestor of both horseshoe crabs and arachnids moved to land, and then essentially diversified into these different groups, with the horseshoe crabs eventually returning back to the water. This may also be true of the eurypterids, at least depending on how they fall out and are related to these other groups, which will need more study, as I've said for a lot of papers this month. There was also a bit of a mix-up about one of the origins of one group of mammals, the mustelids. Today these comprise weasels, badgers, and wolverines. However, their oldest fossils have mostly come from the northern hemisphere and Eurasia specifically, with fossils being found in China and France. A new fossil, though, coming from Mexico, is at least as old or slightly older than the oldest fossil known from France. Named Oaxaca Gale, it was relatively small and honestly had a skull that was a bit weasel-like, with it being very flat and likely suited to a burrowing lifestyle, or at least chasing prey into burrows, much like modern weasels do today. Unfortunately though, Oaxaca Gale was also fairly partial and very damaged during preservation. This means with only 39 characteristics being used in the study, Oaxaca Gale could only have 16 of those plotted onto the overall study for where it fits in the overall mustelid family. This does mean that it's hard to tell if Oaxaca Gale was actually earlier diverging than the other known early mustelids, or if it diverged later, which would help us understand where exactly they may have evolved from. Regardless though, it does show that they diversified and migrated across multiple continents very, very quickly, and they are found on most continents today, everything except for Australia and Antarctica. So they are very successful, and this may be just the first step into them finding that success. While we do have some studies now on the potential for horseshoe crabs to have moved from land to the water, we also have some studies on just the potential movement of animals on land, and these are specifically going to be dinosaurs, which we're using gastroliths. Gastroliths are stones that are swallowed to help grind up food in the stomachs of some animals, even today. Gastroliths recovered from the Wyoming Morrison Formation have been shown to actually have a source that was very, very distant, at least 1,000 kilometers east of where those rocks were found. This shows that at least some very large dinosaurs were migrating thousands of kilometers to get gastroliths and then moving all the way across the continent. This is something that's been very hard to show, and hopefully this is the first step of showing that it did happen in more groups. However, other groups have also shown evidence that they didn't do this. So exactly how widespread large-scale migration is, is still going to be very much up for debate. 
And finally, with the dinosaurs, the end Cretaceous extinction has been up for a lot of debate as to whether it was environmental changes or the impact of a giant rock from space at thousands of kilometers an hour. In general, most studies looking at this extinction have looked at essentially the rates at which animals die out or disappear from the fossil record as you approach the extinction interval, which is marked by a very dark line of iridium. One of the biggest critiques of this method, though, has been that the fossil record is already notoriously incomplete. And so some animals just during those last few million years or a few hundred thousand years may not have just been preserved just straight out of chance. This means that if there's another method of trying to look at the data that's preserved in the rocks, we should try and use it to understand better what was going on in the environment. By looking at data from both global sites and the Hell Creek Formation specifically, it was found that there were some significant limitations in different diversity and spread of animals within the Hell Creek Formation. And this would be due for their adaptations within that specific environment. However, globally, as the paleo environment changed, there was not significant changes in what fauna did exist. Essentially, this just means that there's no one single answer for local changes or global changes that will solve this question. But hopefully, by understanding the combination of how these different factors interacted with one another, we can try to get a better understanding of what the paleo environments were up until the extinction and hopefully get a better understanding of what exactly caused it. Hi everyone, thanks for watching. I probably talked very fast because there was a lot to get through this time. I, I won a grant, that's really exciting. I am now Ezekiel Callahan, Hooper Undergraduate Research Award winning scientist. Um, oh, I'm not gonna introduce myself like that, although I would be, it would be fun. We are going to get our voting up for the Patreon so that people can vote on the next What the Hell Is This video. Be sure to check out the Megalodon video. I, it was a lot of fun to do that for an April Fool's Day bit. You'll understand why when you get there, it's not what you expect. And don't forget to check out the Megalodon shirt. With that in mind, everyone, be safe, take care, wear a mask, and don't go extinct.